I'm super glad that you can come to my virtual meeting today. Yeah, so am I. It's a great yeah. pleasure. Nice to see you after such a long time. Yes, I. You're you know, looking I, younger. And I'm looking older. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've been I've been longing for this interview for donkey's years. And yeah, don't be here, right, I'm, yeah. I'm super glad that uh, finally we made it today. Yes. Okay. So. Uh, why don't we start now? Because right. Uh, right. but first, uh, yeah. before we start, I'd like uh, to, uh, yeah, to introduce you uh, uh, in right. brief. But if I I make some mistakes, then perhaps you can uh, correct correct me because, uh, here, because yeah, um, because uh, uh, my viewers would like to know who my special guest uh, tonight is. Yeah. So. Yes. Here I I've got a special guest uh, tonight. Uh, his name is Mr. Frank Lansman. He is a former uh, colleague of mine when I was teaching at Language Center at Unpar Parayangan University, and it's a great honor for me to have him here. And he he's born and raised in the Netherlands. He, he specializes in American literature. Uh, okay, perhaps you can continue because it's quite a long introduction. Yeah, uh, perhaps yeah, you can. Yeah, I'll just mention the, the relevant bits, not, not from kindergarten onwards, but I, I went to, maybe interesting for Indonesian uh, viewers, I went to Montessori schools in Holland. These are very popular schools. I've seen a few of them in Indonesia. They were created or founded by Maria Montessori, an Italian educationalist. I think her grandson, Mario Montessori, uh, continued this tradition all over Europe. These are very popular schools where the stress is on individual development, but you learn from slightly older pupils and you teach younger pupils. So the, it's kind of what we now call the flipped classroom, where uh, pupils become teachers and teachers kind of uh, change their uh, attitude a little bit, so they're not always monitoring, but they actually write reports um, in the sense of describing this process uh, rather than giving marks. And in the Montessori system, you will find no cheating. So there's, you know, we spent a lot of time and money in Indonesia uh, monitoring tests, um, you know, as we call for now us. But in the Montessori system, there's no cheating because everybody has a different level and you're trying to develop yourself. You're not too obsessed by marks. That's an interesting point. Uh, after my primary school in Amsterdam and the capital of Holland, I went on to a, a Catholic um, junior high school, Ignatius College, which is very strict, completely different world. It was run by Jesuits, by priests, and uh, was extremely disciplined and strict. Kept it up for three years, but then I moved back to the Montessori system for my senior high school, uh, which was Montessori this year in Amsterdam. And I went to study English at the University of Amsterdam, the local state university. Um, and it was very hard to get in because English was extremely popular at the time in 1980, and uh, there was a kind of um, system where if you if you take a Latin in secondary school. You would be accepted anyway, and I was lucky because I chose Latin and Greek and classical languages, so I was accepted on the spot. And um, I took my bachelor's degree in English language and literature. I won a scholarship to England. Uh, this was a, a government scholarship uh, where you didn't have to pay any fees. And at the time, it was extremely expensive to study in England. It was three thousand. Uh, out sterling, which is like 10,000 gil, was five times the normal amount you, you'd pay in Holland. So I was happy to get this opportunity. I, I did have to pay uh, to, to teach Dutch my mother's tongue to a group of librarians in England um, as a way of paying back <laughs> this kind of scholarship. Uh, there I, I did research into literature, especially American literature, and a new subject for me comparative literature, where we compared novels from. Um, of Russian literature, French literature, um, the class of English novels. And uh, when I got back after only one year in England, I 
specialized in American literature because it's, to me it's the most experimental one, the most adventurous kind of literature that really expanded my horizon. I finished in 1988. I took a master's degree. Um, I was proud to get summa cum laude, the highest distinction. Because wow. uh, <laughs> sorry, when I when I was born uh, prematurely, I was born after six months. The doctor said if he lives, he'll be a bricklayer, no more. Because I, I, I can breathe, I didn't get any oxygen to my brain, so people thought I would be uh, retarded. And when I finished with that, such honors, I sent a copy to the doctor who said that to disprove him, to say I didn't yeah, become you, a you proved, or a You proved them wrong. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I, uh, I've been wrong. Doctors can only predict certain action. Yeah. But, uh, demigod, although sometimes treated as such. My father was and um, I, uh, my brother, younger brother, is also an academic, but completely different field, um, uh, mathematical physics, and he's a pure researcher. He, he really does a lot of research. Even from a very young age, when he was 15, he was already writing articles. So different for me, I enjoy teaching. Oh, uh, yes. So your family okay, comes then, from a very high educational background, yeah? Yeah, well, it, um, I think mostly it's not really pressure from my parents, but my grandfather was very much interested in literature from my mm. other side, my maternal grandfather. He always showed me books and gave me a beautiful... Uh, did your grandfather version. also study uh, American literature? Just like what... No, no, he, uh, he was of the generation where only one son could study. Uh, so his, his younger brother became a doctor, medical doctor, Nutrition, and uh, he went into the carpet trade. And, but he always regretted this. He wished he that he studied French or English or languages. My mother, very fluent in French, because she spent two years in France uh, as an au pair, which is a kind of um, you know person taking care of children. And she, so she learned it from kids basically. Because every time she got it wrong, they would laugh at her, and uh, that's for, for her that was the best way to learn. We'll come back to that later, how to learn a program. Um, when I graduated in December 88, uh, this was in the middle of the year, so there's no ceremony. Every time I see an Indonesian ceremony with people wearing caps and gowns and a mm. you know, speech by the rector and all the parents, correct, I'm kind of slightly jealous of this or envious, uh, <laughs> I envy your uh, tradition, because for me, it was just a handshake from the secretary and maybe one professor who was still walking around so good luck. Oh, really? <laughs> so in the old year. days, there, there was no ceremony yeah. at all, no? Well, at the end of the academic year, but I, because I graduated in December, in the middle, you know, after the first semester, um, I, there was nothing going oh, on. Oh, yeah, maybe so, because of that reason, yes? Yeah? Because of that reason that yeah. there was, uh, because it was close to the Christmas, it was close to Christmas Day, yeah. right, yeah? So, uh, where people um, spend their uh, whole probably, Christmas holidays. Mm, right. Uh, so in, in Holland, there's only uh, a graduation ceremony once a year at the end of the year, oh, like in June, June yes. before the next year. So I missed that, um, but I didn't really mind. I, mean, mm. I uh, applied for a job in um, uh, Indonesia, but I was, I was lucky, really. I, uh, I applied to voluntary service overseas in London, um, actually recommended by one of my supervisors in England. He said, uh, why don't you? try to spread your wings and, and find, uh, you know, look for some experience mm. abroad that would be very interesting. He'd been to Uganda, I think, teaching Shakespeare to African students, and uh, he recommended this to me, and I thought, why not, you know, I went to London. I was the only European applicant, everybody else was English, and um, I got the job. I said, where would you like to go? You seem suited to, uh, for Asia, but we also got jobs in America. And, Caribbean, everywhere, in South America. And um, so there, were, uh, there was a number of, of offers. Um, the first one was from the Maldives in, uh, near India, where somebody had been kidnapped, was a coup d'etat, and uh, I thought this is too risky, so I turned it down. The second offer was from Zimbabwe in Africa, where I would have to be a head of school, like a school principal, uh, writing reports all day, I said, well, uh, I really want to teach English. What else have you got? And the third one, well, I was lucky, I got an offer from 
good one at least you have a where a teacher training college had been waiting for seven years uh, because nobody wanted to teach in a traditional town where there were no other foreigners and people basically spoke no English. So I thought, well, let's take the plunge. You know, this is a great adventure. Let, let me try. And this was, uh, it clicked from the start. Uh, I became great friends with um, my counterpart, Agnes Vardolo, who eventually became a professor of English, although his background was in um, Know, international relations. He wasn't really a linguist, but we, you know, we went everywhere together. We spoke English all day. He taught me Indonesian, basically. Um, but before we went to this project, the teacher training college, I took a language course in Yogyakarta, where I think you are from. Um, and this was no, 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 I'm not from Yogyakarta. I'm not from Yogyakarta. I once, You're not from uh, I was once there. I was once there for uh, for uh, study. For the sake of uh, my study, and also I worked there for two years. But I was born and raised in Pekalongan City, in Central oh, Pekalongan, Yes, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. But you, you know, Jogja, and this is uh, this was a small language center called Wisma Realino. Yes. Uh, which is run by teachers who were basically still students. It's near. It's and, near my it, campus. It's near my campus. Yeah. Dharma University. Yes. Right. At the time, it was a teacher training college. It was not yet a university. And, uh, oh, I see. The teachers, uh, the teachers were still studying, but they pretended not to know any foreign language. Actually, they were very fluent, but they're just pretending. Pura pura tidak ngerti. So from day one, uh, you know, we had to speak Indonesian. It's like uh, what we call an immersion course, like somebody pushing <laughs> you into the swimming pool. <laughs> You know, you have to swim. You and then how to... long? How long did it take for you to uh, to master Indonesian language? Well, the, the official course, the crash course, took six weeks, six hours a day, very intensive, and no, no, no translation or anything, no books. Basically, we had to practice using all kinds of objects. You know, this is bigger than that. This is smaller than this. And uh, you know, after only a week or two, we were sent out into the streets to local eating stalls, restaurants, uh, to interview local people, and so on. So we immediately applied what we'd learned: uh, easy stuff like uh, counting colors, uh, getting the price down, you know, haggling, nawar nawar, and so on. And so it was extremely uh, effective. Thought, yes, exactly, know, exactly. That's very uh, an expected way of learning a language. Yeah, yeah, uh, and was kind of unique because I, I felt, you know, I spent six years in secondary school learning French, but I can't speak French at this level, you know, mm. with, uh, because everything was very theoretical. It was based mm. on literature, and when I got to France on holiday, you know, I could, could hardly speak because. What do you talk about? You, you can't just yeah. quote from uh, short stories you've read or novels. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So in Holland, it's still very much based on theoretical knowledge at the time and uh, literature and not so much um, daily conversation. And this was the strength of, of this crash course. So I was very happy. Unfortunately, there was no Javanese teacher because the teachers came from all over Indonesia. So when I got to Tuban, which is, as I said, a very traditional town, my students didn't really speak Indonesian, but they always spoke Japanese at the medium level, at Moko. And uh, so after a while, I picked that up as well. Um, but I can't really speak it. I never took a course in it. Um, I spent two years in Bern, uh, then one year at, in Bandung at this university, um, Arahyang Catholic University, where there was a project with Belgium. Every month, the, the Belgian university would send a professor teaching a master's program, uh, always different subjects. And I prepared students who were young lecturers at the time, um, you know, um, for holding a discussion, asking questions, uh, writing research papers and so on. Very exciting. Only one year. Uh, then I went back to Holland for a bit, uh, just to teach at the secondary school to see if I could still feel at home in Holland, you know, if I hadn't become estranged. And um, this was in a small town uh, famous for its cheese, Alkmaar, in the north, where uh, even my students would write notes on, on bits of cheese, you know, <laughs> uh, cheating tests. And when I discovered this, they quickly uh, they would eat the bread containing the, che the cheating uh, notes. Uh, very funny. Uh, but there's only a few months replacing somebody who uh, was on maternity leave. 
And uh, so I thought, well, I really miss Indonesia. Why don't I try another project uh, in East Java? This time in Jombang, in the middle of East Java, um, where one of your presidents uh, came from, uh, Abdul Rahman Wahid, or Gus Dur, he, I think he was born in Jombang. Um, and uh, I taught uh, you know, another two years there at the teacher training college. And I met my wife. I, uh, Media Studi was uh, finishing up there. Actually, I didn't really teach her, but she was she just been writing up her thesis or her final paper. And we met uh, by chance, really, because she was not in one of my classes. And um, we married at the end of my contract. I took her to the Caribbean, uh, to an international school for three years where I taught English. Um, and these people come from all over the world. I mean, um, most of the people on Caribbean islands are of African descent, but then you've got the Portuguese, um, Americans, Dutch, people of Dutch descent, so a real mix. Sometimes you see black people with blue eyes, for instance, a very kind of mixed type of, of pupil. Um, and that was for only three years. The only problem there was um, that there was a lot of crime on that island because of the drug problem. A lot of people became addicted to drugs at the time. This was crack cocaine, and to in order to get those drugs, uh, they would break into houses, break into cars, and so on. So our house was burgled twice. Uh, I lost my bike, my sport shoes. <laughs> this is getting a bit uh, dangerous, and it was also getting on my wife's nerves because she was basically at home all day. She was not allowed to teach, although she was a high school teacher. Um, but the contract uh, kind of excluded her. From teaching, so we were there for three years, and finally in 2000 we returned to Indonesia after the fall of Suharto. And um, I was lucky because at, at the same university, Parahyangan uh, Catholic University, Umpar, uh, all the Australians and Americans had left um, in 2000 because there were problems with their work permits, or they were not qualified enough, or dicti became stricter. They wanted master's degrees, uh, you know. For not just Asal Bule, and not the, as long as you're a foreigner, so you have a white face, you can teach, but we can much more uh, strict. And uh, so I was lucky, this is exodus of people leaving, and I could take my place again, along with my old friend Pajoko Prano from East Java, uh, who'd, been, who'd actually replaced me more or less uh, for almost a decade. And um, so I, I've been here ever since, since 2000 until now, 2022. So all in all, two years in Tuban, two years in Jombang, one year with the Belgian University in Bandung, uh, and now 22 years, all in all, 27 years to answer your question. You said, how, how long have you been living in Indonesia? Yeah. 27 years. Wait a minute, more, more. wait a minute. I mean, I'm sorry I have to cut, cut you off. I mean, uh, really, that's yeah. an impressive uh, introduction, yeah. But in fact, uh, I uh, I was about to come to the nitty gritty of today's meeting. Well, uh, okay. as the as my viewers would like to know you more, uh, so the nitty gritty of today's meeting here, I've got some questions, uh, five questions actually to you, Mr. Frank. So okay, now let's start with the first one. Yeah. Uh, this one, uh, how long have you been living in Indonesia? Yeah, so yeah, uh, you, you were about to answer my questions, but I I just cut you off, but now you can answer it. <laughs> so how long have yeah. you been living in Indonesia, all in all? Uh, all in all, 27 years, so more than a quarter of a years. century. Wow, quite a yeah. long time, yeah? So uh, how do you feel, how do you feel uh, living in Indonesia? Uh, I, I, to be honest, I, I loved it from day one. Uh, when day I, one, uh, yeah, as you said uh, in your long story that you, the first time you, uh, I mean, you set your foot in Indonesia, uh, then you start to love uh, Indonesia, and yeah, until now, you're still living uh, yeah, in I've Indonesia. Never... Yeah, uh, a lot of my friends back in Holland thought I was crazy because I didn't know the language. I didn't mm. know much about the country. Uh, people were afraid of tropical diseases like malaria. This actually uh, comes to the second, sorry, uh, this actually comes to question number two, yeah? 
Uh, why did you choose to work and live in Indonesia? Now, this actually uh, will be the next question. Please, Frank. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And I, I've often uh, tried to analyze what made me uh, take this plunge where most of my friends would never do this, what, what yeah. made me different. Because uh, even my relative, my father supported it because he had, uh, when, as a young doctor, he'd gone to Africa on a kind of voluntary basis. And, uh, but he worked for an American factory in Liberia. And he actually, he wanted to move to um, the East Coast, uh, to Tanzania, which was then a socialist country. But then there were a lot of political troubles and all foreigners were asked to leave because it was considered too dangerous. But he always told me, Frank, you should have been born in Dar es Salaam, you know, in Tanzania, <laughs> uh, if I'd stayed there, but it never happened. So he supported it. But a lot of other people in my family and among my uh, university friends, you know, um, thought this was a very risky kind of adventure and they would never do this. Uh, you know, they would just settle for a job in Holland after graduating. It would never go abroad. So I was the only one. What is the reason? Number one, it's a sense of, of adventure, I think, looking adventure. for a new experience. Mm -hmm. uh, Indonesia, for most Dutch people, is a very exotic country. We've had long ties with Indonesia and some of it, uh, of course, uh, we could I mean, we need to regret now, uh, among my generation, there's a whole discussion going on whether colonialism, uh, you know, if it wasn't close to slavery, basically, slavery system. So we, we need to be very critical. If you talk to older people in Holland, they think, oh, it was just VOC, you know, it was a, a trade relation. But now I've heard many stories from Indonesian that, uh, from Indonesians, uh, from their families, from their uh, Histories, you know, personal history. That was an extremely tough system uh, where people would work on plantations from the age of eight till eighty-eight, let's say, till they died, mm. without any holidays, without any medical support. Uh, you know, extremely tough life, and um, mm. this is kind of hushed up. You know, when you learn history in Holland, people kind of gloss over this and don't really take it so seriously. And what's another history. reason, Frank? So the first one is uh, adventure, yeah, and then what's... Uh, I was called up for military, yeah, sorry, I was called up for military service, there's conscription in Holland, at the time there was still the system where you had to stay, uh, to um, become an army recruit for 18 months or longer if you wanted to become an officer. So I was called up and people said, because I'd already finished my studies, um, and the recruitment, uh, recruiting officer said, well, Frank, you've got this language background. Why don't you learn Russian and become a spy? And I said, who do I spy for? <laughs> said, yeah. Can you speak Russian? Six months I'm French friends person. from Ra Russia, from Russia. <laughs> but I cannot speak any Russia at all. <laughs> I've got quite the, many uh, friends, Russian friends. Yeah, can you speak Russian? Oh, really? Yeah. But, but no, so, so they offered this to me, uh, a six month crash course in Russian, then I would have to spy or eavesdrop, you know, Mupingi on uh, Vladimir Putin, who was then in the KGB. Being, a, KGB fly, being a spy on the wall. You had, you had to be a yeah. spy on the wall. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he was in Ger I think he was stationed in, stationed in Germany as uh, a KGB, you know, Secret Service agent. Hmm. And I would have to spy on him, but it never happened because then there was a medical test, and I've got bad eyesight in minus five. I'm short sighted. People said, Oh, he's going to shoot his own general. That's very dangerous. We don't want people with eye problems, eyesight problems. So I was, I was not accepted. And I, they said, Where, where do you want to go? And I said, Well, I'm planning to go to Indonesia. Oh, yes, good luck. Uh, you know, uh, have a nice time there. So I was, and a year later, um, after uh, they decided to, get, to establish a professional army. So People were no longer called up uh, for military service. It was just a purely professional army, so I got off lightly. Uh, but then, um, of course, Indonesia. I, I was when I was a child. I'd like to read horror stories, and there was one story about Santet that intrigued me. Uh, you know, where you have a puppet. What, what, you do, uh, what do you call a Santet in 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 English? In English. Well, it's like a, like a, puppet uh, you stick needles in or you you somehow you you yeah uh, yeah kind of torture uh, then you will uh, mm -hmm. yeah someone who is an expert in spiritual uh yeah, things that right. will put uh, some spell yeah on you 
Yeah. Yes. But uh, what do we have a specific term for the word sunset in English? No. Um, I think it refers to the uh, the magic you you magical work practice. on the puppets. Magical practice. Yeah, like voodoo practice or something, voodoo, uh, or something supernatural. Like I would say supernatural practices. Yeah, something like that. Supernatural practice. Mm. This is a short story I read about the puppet. Somebody who wanted to take revenge on a on an enemy, and um, by puppet by using this puppet. You were I, interested I, interested in knowing yeah, more about yeah, something. That was impressive. Also, I had I played volleyball as a teenager, and most of my uh, volleyball mates were of Indonesian descent. Funnily enough, uh, they, they had mm. Javanese or Ambonese um, ancestors, but they didn't speak any Indonesian. Uh, you know, uh, they were third generation, and they grew uh, they grown up in Holland, um, oh, and they knew a little bit about cooking or about batik, but not they didn't speak any of the language. But anyway, uh, so I, I was always intrigued by Indonesia as a kind of mysterious country or exotic country. I wanted to know about the education oh, I'm system. I'm sorry, uh, we are about to run uh, out of time, Frank. Yeah, there is a notice okay. here. Yeah, let's move on to the next question then. <laughs> okay, now let's go better. Let's be quick, yeah, uh, before the yeah. meeting ends. And question number three, what do you like about Indonesia? Um, yeah, I prepared the question. Can you please mention only, only two things? What do you like yeah. about Indonesia? Um, well, first of all, the people are extremely welcoming, very friendly. Uh, the Indonesian smile is famous all over the world, but it's, mm. a, it's a sincere smile. It's not a smile for tourists friendly or people, just... Yeah, friendly know. people. And then what's the second one? Uh, the second one is Indonesian culture. I find extremely Indonesian interesting culture. because it's a very mixed culture. For instance, Kronjong music uh, has a lot of influence from Portuguese, Fado music, and then it's mixed mixed with European instruments. Uh, so the, the culture has already captured your attention. Uh, that's Many, why uh, you fall in love with Indonesia. Uh, especially uh, dance and music. These are yes. two. Yeah, most tourists also uh, also say that. Okay. And then the next question, what Indonesian character traits do you admire? Only two. Mention only yeah. two, please. I'll restrict it to two. Um, one is the willingness to work together. Uh, you know, oh, you are yeah, willingness to work together. Yes, great team workers, uh, not just, um, you know, at, uh, at university where we do many things together, but also in our neighborhood. Uh, yeah, I think you call it Gotong Royong, mutual aid. Mm -hmm. And um, this is very the strong, a strong, and um, yeah, and the second one is, uh, I think, uh, so the willingness to work together. And the second one is resilience. If something resilience. goes wrong in life, if there's a natural disaster or something goes wrong, uh, you know, among colleagues, people always find a way of, of resolving that problem. Uh, people are extremely flexible and they never give up. So it's a very strong kind of mentality or mindset, people say now. From Indonesian people, That's yeah, that, that, you, that impress that you. Happened. Tsunami happened when there's an earthquake but also a smaller conflicts among people but are always resolved. But one willingness to work together, yeah, Frank. Willingness to work and together. Two is that's, I think the, uh, that's the resilient. most um, distinguished uh, tra trait that uh, Indonesian people yeah, must be proud yeah. of. Yeah. yeah. And connected with this, a sense of humor. Uh, people always see the funny side of things, so they never yes, take exactly. it yeah. <laughs> seriously. Indonesian that was always people like the, humor. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, you the last question, laugh at the I'm sorry, because we are running out of time. Yeah, the last question. Right. What, uh, yeah, as uh, you, as we know that, yeah, well, you are an expert. I can, I can consider you are an expert in English. Yeah. So, uh, would you please sharing, would you please, uh, would you please share with us your tips and tricks, uh, on how to learn English effectively? Make it brief, yes. please. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep brief. Uh, first uh, of all, embrace English. Uh, yeah, embrace English. Don't see it as a kind of dentist appointment, something you have to do, or you're forced to do, or something unpleasant. Embrace English. Try to love English as much as possible. Um, try to expose yourself as much as possible to English. Uh, for instance, YouTube is ideal 
where you get documentaries, movies, interviews, all kinds of stuff. Take notes while you're watching. Uh, so write down what you find interesting or different. Um, and try to expand that knowledge. Also analyze a little bit uh, what's what makes English different from Indonesian. Why do people say things in a certain way? What makes um, English difficult, like idiomatic phrases? Uh, don't be too obsessed uh, with grammar because native speakers always make a lot of mistakes as well. If you check any kind of social media site, you see a lot of mistakes. So don't be obsessed. With, you know, you don't have to be perfect as long as you get your message across. So this is a kind of communicative approach. And uh, most of all, uh, apply your knowledge. So when you learn something, try to make up a context where this can be used based on your own life, on your own experience, and make it real, make it relatable, you know, uh, make it kind of concrete. That's very interesting. And finally, don't be afraid of making mistakes. Just when you meet a foreigner, you know, a tourist in the street, ask politely, you know, with your famous smile, um, you know, do you have five minutes or 10 minutes to talk? Uh, I'd like to practice my English. And nine out of 10 tourists w would love the opportunity to talk to local wow. people. Wow, so, such great yeah. tips and tricks. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for sharing. And thank you so much for coming uh, in, our, in my uh, meeting today. And I hope to see you next time yeah. if uh, there is uh, another meeting. And I hope that you won't mind you uh, coming to my next meeting if there is any yeah thank you oh, so much and good. have a good weekend frank and send my regards to your family that you yeah okay, okay bye thank you very much for the yeah. opportunity and yeah. all the best with your channel and your general activities and my okay. love to your family as well yeah thank, thank you, you very much bye yes bye, bye.